Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the year 1968. In our previous lectures, we talked about the Tet Offensive of January 1968, the hugely important events taking place during the Vietnam War. And as those lectures concluded, I talked about the impact on the American home front and particularly on the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, essentially bringing an end to a once popular president. In these lectures, we'll pick up that story a little bit more and talk about the presidential election process early in 1968. In these first lectures, we'll focus on the Democratic Party, Lyndon Johnson's party, the impact of the Tet Offensive, and on Lyndon Johnson's decision not to run again, and some of the candidates on the Democratic side. In lectures a little bit later in the course, we'll talk about the Republican candidates and the election itself. As 1968 began, it was widely assumed that the sitting president, Lyndon Johnson, would certainly be the Democratic candidate and in all likelihood would win re-election in that year's presidential election in November. While he technically had served during more than one presidential term already, he was still eligible to run in 1968 because he had only filled out the final 14 months of John F. Kennedy's term after Kennedy's assassination. So he was eligible to run, and while there were some glitches along the way during his presidency, he was largely popular and considered a sure thing to at least be the Democratic candidate. And this is the line of thinking uh, in the quote on the screen. The liberal establishment, although for different reasons, generally took the same view, that you couldn't oppose Johnson effectively unless you had a major candidate by which was normally meant Robert Kennedy. And you wouldn't get a candidate, so it was irresponsible and demagogic to oppose him at all. But that line of thinking was shaken up by the Tet Offensive, and certainly shaken up by Lyndon Johnson's shocking announcement that he was not going to run for re-election. But even before that announcement, at least one candidate, Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota, had shown a willingness to throw his hat in the ring and challenge Johnson. He was essentially running on one platform. He was an anti-war candidate in the Democratic Party. McCarthy grew up in the small town of Watkins, Minnesota, and he was a deeply devout Catholic. He was raised in a deeply religious family and went to school in uh, heavily Catholic institutions and schools. And for a time in his youth, he actually considered going into the monastery himself, and he spent nine months training as a monk before deciding that wasn't his true calling. In the midst of the Great Depression, he attended St. John's University in Minnesota and then earned a master's degree from the University of Minnesota in 1939. He went on to become ultimately a professor of economics and education back at St. John's, where he was during the early years of World War II. Through the late 1940s and 50s, he served as a member of the United States House of Representatives from 1949 to 59. But he finally reached a larger stage in 1960 when he gave a speech supporting uh, Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson for the presidential nomination. During that speech, he said, do not reject this man who made us all proud to be called Democrats. And he was hailed in the aftermath of that speech and established a national reputation for himself. He served in the United States Senate from 1959 to 1971. And as the 1968 presidential election loomed on the horizon, he considered a run for the presidency, but like so many, and as I indicated with the quote a moment ago, uh, it just didn't seem realistic with Lyndon Johnson, a popular sitting president. But after a conversation with his daughter, in which she said, essentially, don't you want to be remembered in history for some nobler act than support of LBJ's re-election? He decided to throw his hat in the ring. By August of 1967, he was beginning to turn against Lyndon Johnson, particularly on the issue of the Vietnam War. And he decided in November of 1967 
to join the campaign. Many thought Bobby Kennedy might have been a better candidate, but he was more calculating than McCarthy was politically, and he worried that he might lose. We'll talk a little bit more about Bobby Kennedy's decision whether or not to join the race in just a moment. McCarthy was essentially a one-platform candidate. He was opposed to the Vietnam War. But even that one platform did garner him some support, and his campaign uh, established a, a modicum of support leading up to 1968 and into January. As he pointed towards the New Hampshire primary, a number of anti-war college students and other activists traveled from around the country to support his campaign. In some cases, uh, long-haired hippies cut their hair and cleaned up their act to support his campaign, which led to a, a popular slogan of that era, Get Clean for Gene. McCarthy certainly didn't stir one's emotions in the way that a John F. Kennedy or even Robert Kennedy did in terms of rhetoric. When he announced his campaign in November of 1967, he said, I am concerned that the administration seems to have set no limit to the price it is willing to pay for a military victory. This is hardly stirring rhetoric. But public perception of McCarthy began to change after the Tet Offensive, which I talked about in the previous lectures, and which started in January of 1968. Now much of the country began to see eye to eye with Eugene McCarthy in terms of the war. And McCarthy had that first mover status as uh, the first candidate to oppose Lyndon Johnson on the issue of the war. In the New Hampshire primary on March 12th, when McCarthy scored 42% of the popular vote and Lyndon Johnson 49%, meaning the sitting president had won by only 7% of the vote, it was a clear sign that the nation was ready for an anti-war candidate a signal that was picked up most powerfully by Robert Kennedy, again, a, a candidate that many had thought would be a stronger candidate than McCarthy. On March 16th, Kennedy announced that he would run. And not long after that, I, I mentioned in the previous lecture, on March 31st, Lyndon Johnson gave that shocking speech in which he announced that he would not seek re-election. And so this campaign that at the start of the year had seemed like an open and shut case, was now thrown wide open. Instantly upon joining the race, Bobby Kennedy became the favorite among the Democrats, and particularly after Lyndon Johnson's withdrawal. Johnson's announcement came partly as a result of internal polling that indicated that he had little chance of winning the primaries, particularly against Bobby Kennedy. And so I want to take just a moment to point out that polling and the process, uh, the primary process in 1968, were quite different than they are today. Um, polling itself was not exactly in its infancy. Polls had been around for decades, um, but they were far more um, primitive than they are today and less reliable than they are today. And political experts had not uh, deduced ways to uh, plumb all of the various elements involved in polling as they are now. And so we look back in hindsight uh, with uh, much less certainty that the polls had it right at that time. But Johnson's decision was anchored, at least in part, on polls that showed he had little chance to defeat Robert Kennedy. And the primary process was very different in 1968. At that time, there were only 13 states that held primaries before the conventions themselves. And so the great majority of the delegates would be decided at the convention rather than the primaries. Uh, this had the dual effect of making the early primaries more important in the sense that there were only a handful of them, so you had to make an impression while you could, but at the same time, less important because it was entirely feasible that one could not win a single delegate vote in the primaries and yet still win the nomination of their party. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in 1968. We'll get into some of those details more in just a moment. 
but it might be difficult for students today and others uh, hearing about this process to grasp the possibility that one might reach August of an election year when the election is in November and the party still didn't know who the candidate is. In our modern uh, electoral process in the United States, the candidates are known essentially a year before the election takes place, and the primaries are what decides that process. Well, all of that occurs after 1968, and in part because of 1968, and some of the rising and falling that takes place during the primaries in 1968. But again, it really is Lyndon Johnson's uh, bombshell speech and announcement on March 31st that throws open the Democratic um, Party nomination. And in the aftermath of that announcement, the, the party splinters into a number of different factions, which over the next handful of months uh, essentially duke it out for who's going to be the, the nominee. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these candidates, and we'll talk about this process as we go. But in essence, uh, a, a good bit of kind of the, the traditional party core, these are uh, labor unions and uh, mayors and local officials. They back Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey, who we'll talk about much more in the lecture following this one. Eugene McCarthy, as I've mentioned, he does continue to hold... Uh, swing with a certain part of the population, particularly students who had gotten behind his campaign early, uh, university professors and intellectuals, uh, anti-war activists, a number of them kind of stick with Eugene McCarthy as the primary process carries on. And then there is the gripping campaign of Robert Kennedy, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. And he had a, a solid hold on Catholics, African Americans, other racial and ethnic minorities, uh, and a growing chunk of the anti-war population. And then there's a final group, which are primarily white Southern Democrats, which have uh, been called Dixiecrats within the Democratic Party starting in 1948 and through the 1950s. And this group was um, kind of split between supporting Hubert Humphrey, again, we'll talk more about him in the next lecture, and uh, Alabama's Governor George Wallace, who launches a third-party campaign um, as this election unfolds, and we'll talk more about him later in the semester when we discuss the election itself. But as soon as he announces his candidate, candidacy, it is Robert Kennedy, or Bobby Kennedy, who seizes the attention of the nation and instantly becomes the favorite to win the nomination. Kennedy was born in 1925 in Brookline, Massachusetts, and he enjoys the upbringing of a Kennedy. This was American royalty. He attended the top elite private prep schools, um, lived in huge mansions in New York, had summer homes in uh, Massachusetts, a winter home in Palm Beach, Florida, and so on. So he has the, the best of everything uh, throughout his upbringing. Uh, as World War II begins, uh, Kennedy is too young for service, but ultimately he did enlist um, towards the end of World War II and had a brief career in the Navy as the war was coming to an end and in the year after the end of World War II. So he did not see combat, but he did serve and ultimately uh, was honorably discharged after the war was over. In September of 1946, after his service in the Navy, he began uh, attending Harvard University. Again, he has this elite uh, education and background. Uh, he played football at Harvard until he suffered an injury as a very well-rounded and robust college experience. Uh, he also travels the world, much like uh, the Kennedys did, and at times he traveled, went on lengthy uh, trips around parts of the world with his brother, John F. Kennedy, uh, with whom he eventually has a very close relationship. But he tours Europe, the Middle East, Asia, many other parts of the world. So he, he truly does have a worldly view of things. In 
He also, uh, after Harvard, attended the University of Virginia Law School and launched his career in the early 50s as a lawyer with the United States Department of Justice. And so that is the, the root of his early career, uh, broken up at times when he goes to work for his brother, John F. Kennedy, uh, as his campaign manager, which he does in 1952 and again in 1960. In the midst of this, he begins to establish a reputation of his own, in December of 1952, he began working uh, for Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy as part of the uh, Senate Subcommittee on Investigations. And so for a while, he is involved in the so-called witch hunts of the early 1950s. Uh, like all of the Kennedys, he is a staunch anti-communist, and that uh, leaning would stay with him throughout his career. Later in the 1950s, he was part of the hearings uh, against the notorious uh, labor leader Jimmy Hoffa and uh, the racketeering scandals of that era. And then during the Kennedy presidency in the early 1960s, he was appointed attorney general by his brother John F. Kennedy, and he is one of Kennedy's closest advisors during the Cuban Missile Crisis and other aspects of the presidency. After his brother's assassination in 1963, Kennedy decided to run for the United States Senate and began truly establishing a career and reputation of his own. He, he won the 1964 Senate race in New York and quickly began establishing a reputation as a powerful orator and a champion of uh, minorities and equal rights. In June of 1966, on a visit to South Africa where he witnessed uh, apartheid, he made one of his most famous statements when he said, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. During this period, Kennedy also cautioned Lyndon Johnson about escalation of the Vietnam War and thus began to be associated with the anti-war cause. He was also a great champion of the war on, pop, on poverty and became very popular with African Americans and other minorities, as I mentioned. Uh, he spoke out forcefully uh, for what he described as the disaffected, the impoverished, and the excluded and this becomes one of his strongest constituencies after he declares his candidacy in 1968. Kennedy had long contemplated a run for the presidency, but thought, like many, that his chances were doomed in January of 1968, facing off against Lyndon Johnson. But after the Tet Offensive, and after the New Hampshire primary, which we've talked about, Kennedy decided that he legitimately had a chance and he threw his hat in the ring on March 16, 1968, saying, I do not run for the presidency merely to oppose any man, but to propose new policies. I run because I am convinced that this country is on a perilous course, and because I have such strong feelings about what must be done, and I feel that I'm obliged to do all I can. Kennedy brought renewed enthusiasm and vigor to this presidential race, and he had a great following among minorities and among the young and the anti-war uh, population in the country, which again, after Tet, was growing rapidly. At the same time, he had many fierce and powerful enemies who were opposed to him, which ultimately contributes to his downfall as well. On April 4th, 1968, when Kennedy and the rest of the world learned of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Kennedy gave a powerful speech in Indianapolis and appealed to both sides for peace and not rioting in the aftermath of the assassination. And he spoke about his own recollections at his brother's uh, assassination. And this was a, a powerful speech and again helped to secure his reputation during this period. And yet, tragically, his campaign 
and his life, in fact, were short-lived. On June 4, 1968, Kennedy won a major victory in the California primary. He gave a speech in the aftermath of that, a victorious speech, and as he left the ballroom, this was at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, leaving the ballroom and walking back through hallways to the kitchen on his way uh, out of the building. He was shot and ultimately died from the shots from Sirhan Sirhan, a 24-year-old Palestinian terrorist. And Kennedy died early the next morning. He was eulogized by his brother, Senator Ted Kennedy, who made a number of powerful statements. He said, my brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life to be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. And then Kennedy added, some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? Kennedy's body then was transported to Washington, D.C., and thousands of people lined the railroad tracks as that train went by, uh, where he was carried to his resting place in Arlington National Cemetery near, the, uh, near his brother, John. The death of Robert Kennedy was a huge blow to the country, and we'll talk more about his assassination a little bit later in the course. This is one of the powerful and indelible moments of that year. But it also threw open once again a presidential race on the Democratic side that had already been turned on its head several different times over just the first few months of the year. In fact, it was a candidate that we've barely mentioned so far, Hubert Humphrey, who would wind up winning the Democratic nomination. <laughs> 